This morning there will be a few little changes, as there always are in our programs, and a couple of, um, I, I hope, uh, interesting surprises along the way. Uh, but not in Rick's session. Rick's session is as billed. Rick, please. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Uh, two um, quick introductory comments, and then we'll be introducing our speakers. Uh, the first is that when Mark asked me to organize the panel, I got excited because there is, um, I think, a groundswell of activity in pediatric ethics that just was not here in the late 80s when, uh, when I was training uh, here in Chicago. There are several um, uh, pediatric ethics programs around the country that are uniquely dedicated to the questions uh, that come up in, in the health care of children. So uh, I'm excited to have a panel that looks at that um, relatively new development. The other piece of that is the, the second comment, the um, future-looking uh, nature of the title. Um, the, the panel um, as a whole is called What is the Future of Pediatric Ethics? Bioethics has always had a tendency to try to stay ahead of the curve, to look toward the future um, without necessarily um, thinking in terms of a crystal ball, because none of us have a crystal ball. But I think part of our job in bioethics uh, is to anticipate uh, what's going to happen. So I'm really excited to have uh, four of the most uh, distinguished pediatric ethicists in the country here to um, think a little bit about the future of that field. Our first speaker is Norman Faust, MD, MPH. Norm has been at University of Wisconsin since 1973. And uh, I have to say that in the 1980s, um, when I was a medical student, went to Madison, spent a very nice month with uh, Norm, I remember. He's a professor of pediatrics and bioethics, director of the program in medical ethics, and he founded that program in 1973. He is vice chair of the Department of Medical History and Bioethics, and he is a general pediatrician. He's been chair of the Ethics Committee for 24 years and chair of health, the Health Sciences IRB for 31 years. A, um, a veritable font of uh, wisdom and experience. He was director of the Peds Residency Training Program for 20 years, and he founded the Child Protection Team, and he was vice chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the uh, home of the Badgers uh, for 10 years, from 1985 to 95. So please welcome Ron Foster. Uh, Santiana said, uh, those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. <clears throat> In newborn screening, it doesn't really matter, though, whether you study history. It just keeps getting repeated anyway. Um, uh, so I'm going to uh, review some of this history, which just keeps happening over and over again. As, as Yogi says, it, it's hard to predict the future. Um, but I think that's not right. I think Dr. Phil got it right um, when he said that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Pretty much everybody has said that. And so I'm going to just briefly discuss the past behavior of newborn screening and give you a very current example to show that the problems just keep happening, the same exact same problems keep happening. So I'm going to say a little bit about the PKU story, which was the first <clears throat> newborn screening program, and then some brief comments about some non-genetic screening programs involving bicarbonate oxygen and bilirubin. I'll say more about that. And then a brief summary of uh, Wisconsin's experience with a rare disorder called MBAD, and then um, make a prediction which is not going to be very difficult. So PKU, as most of you know, is a very rare inborn error of metabolism causing profound retardation, <coughs> virtually all affected children, in which phenylalanine, which the amino acid that's ubiquitous in protein, gets turned into lots of good stuff in the body. But if you have this disease, that enzyme is deficient, and instead the phenylalanine accumulates and turns into bad stuff that causes brain damage and other problems. <clears throat> this was well known for almost 100 years. Um, and uh, it was known that if you put children on a low phenylalanine diet, phenylalanine diet, you could ameliorate the brain symptoms. <clears throat> but the diagnosis was inefficient. It depended on getting a urine sample from infants at their first well baby check, which was inefficient and too late. And children who were on milk even for a few weeks <clears throat> had irreversible damage. The diet was very expensive and unpalatable and hard to comply with. In 1960, there were three big breakthroughs. Robert Guthrie discovered an ingenious test that was cheap, simple, sensitive, 
uh, that made it possible to diagnose this condition, to really screen for it uh, <clears throat> uh, for every newborn on a single drop of blood. Second, the Mee Johnson Corporation developed a milk called Lofenilac that was more palatable and affordable. And third, John F. Kennedy was elected president with his interest in stamping out mental retardation. And Kennedy and Guthrie and a handful of others formed a PKU lobby to create a mandatory newborn screening program, which was initiated without any systematic studies about the test characteristics <clears throat> or about the diet. The assumptions of the PKU program were that a positive test confirmed by a whole blood assay would lead to mental retardation in nearly all cases, and second, that a diet with reduced phenylalanine uh, would reduce the severity or possibly even prevent mental retardation. <clears throat> the program had two problems. First, the first assumption was false, and second, the second assumption was false. Other than that, it was flawless. Um, it turned out the test was um, one of the worst tests ever devised. It had a 95% false positive rate. It is a, a positive Guthrie test gives is a 20 to 1 likelihood of being normal. And that's even when confirmed by a whole blood assay. That is, having hyperphenylalaninemia um, in most cases is of no clinical consequence. Um, and second, it turned out that dietary restriction um, is as harmful as dietary excess. Withholding this essential amino acid means you can't build proteins in your brain or anywhere else in your body. The consequences of these false assumptions was first a false positive impression that the diet was working. It was in some cases, but there were many normal children enrolled in the program, and they turned, but you didn't know they were normal. They were labeled as having a disease. They turned out to be normal, and everybody said, fantastic. The more serious problem was that some of these normal children were made retarded by the diet because of excessive restriction of phenylalanine, and in rare cases, profound protein malnutrition, cases of kwashiorkor, began to develop in these clinics, and there were some deaths. Um, the number of children who were harmed by the program, of normal children, is not known because this was not being studied in any systematic way. There was one other late surprise, which is that the girls who were successfully treated um, went on to reproduce in the normal rate and were back on a normal diet, so they had astronomical levels of phenylalanine in their blood, which exposed the fetus to um, profound um, pterogen. It's probably the most potent pterogen known to the human organism. Virtually 100% of such babies are profoundly damaged. We have a mother in Madison who's now made three such infants. So what are the lessons from this story that keep repeating? First, genetic disorders are heterogeneous. There is no such thing as a single gene disorder, not sickle cell disease, not cystic fibrosis. There is just one mutation for sickle cell disease, but affected children can die in infancy or can live to a ripe old age. Cystic fibrosis, as we know, is a thousand diseases, not just one. So when you screen for a <clears throat> disease um, with a phenotypic test, like a chemical assay, um, you're going to wind up with a hodgepodge of different disorders, and therefore treatment programs are going to have different risk-benefit um, ratios for each child. That's point one. Point two, new screening programs, which are proliferating, <clears throat> are experiments, or should be thought of as experiments, subject to clinical trials or at least systematic scientific studies with the usual protections of institutional review and high standards for consent. There is no FDA for newborn screening. So anyone who has an idea can just start these things if he can get it through a committee or two. Third, we learned that mandatory programs are hard to stop. When the problems with the PKU program that I described came to light and it took a decade for these to be elucidated, uh, nobody wanted to stop routine screening other than the state of Maryland, which was the only state which had enough sense to slow it down and <clears throat> reconsider. Uh, and the fourth is that zeal clouds critical thinking. Zeal, of course, is essential for progress. All great um, accomplishments are usually the result of one or two zealous, and I mean that in the best sense of the word, but zeal is not the same as critical rational thinking. So that when the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Nutrition in 1965 sent a letter to the secretary of DHHS, then DHEW, urging that the mandatory PKU program be stopped because we didn't know the significance of a positive test and we didn't know uh, 
what the right dose of the diet was, <clears throat> it was suppressed and the programs continued. And it was seven years later before some of these facts that I mentioned began to attract wider attention. There are many other examples of screening newborns for treatment, not all genetic. Um, just quickly, three examples that collectively have harmed, I would say conservatively, thousands and probably tens of thousands of children. Prematurity, the most common cause of death in children, uh, which causes lung dysfunction, hyaluronic membrane disease, or respiratory distress syndrome, carbon dioxide retention, acidosis, and death, if not treated, um, was, quote, solved by a leader in neonatology who said, oh, this is no problem. There's too many hydrogen ions. Just give a buffer of bicarbonate. That'll combine with the hydrogen ions and produce carbonic acid, which will turn into carbon dioxide and water. The water will get excreted, and the carbon dioxide will get exhaled. My mentor and colleague, uh, Jerry O'Dell, said, this is nonsense. Just uh, with a pencil and a paper, this is nonsense. This will create more carbon dioxide, which has nowhere to go, and produce more acid. He proved this in a rat, that bicarbonate made the problem worse. But every single newborn with this disorder in North America got bicarbonate for a decade or more until another disciple of Dr. O'Dell's, Mike Simmons, published a landmark study of unethical studies, that is, withholding standard treatment from affected newborns because it had never been proven effective. And uh, Mike Simmons showed that, in fact, bicarbonate made you worse, and of the, that is, the mortality rate was higher, and of the children who survived, there was a very high incidence of massive intracranial hemorrhage because this is a very concentrated osmotic solution that sucks water out of the brain and makes the brain shrink and lots of vessels rupture. There hasn't been a baby that's received bicarbonate for this condition in 30 years, but for a decade, everyone got it. This, this, that is, children of this subpopulation were screened and treated with no systematic studies. Oxygen for 100 years was given indiscriminately to newborns who were blue. They were screened with a simple inspection test. You looked at them, and if they were blue, you gave them oxygen. We learned to refine that with expensive technology and actually measure the oxygen, but we still gave, that is the level of oxygen, but we still gave indiscriminate oxygen for 80 years until Arnold Patz, one man at Johns Hopkins, began to wonder why so many of these babies were blind and found out that oxygen was a major contributor to retroventral fibroplasia or retinopathy of prematurity. So finally, studies were done to, and oxygen was treated like a drug, and dose response curves were figured out. We now know what's too much and what's not enough, and we know how to measure it. This was a screening program uh, of the subpopulation with treatment, with the hypothesis that it can't possibly be harmful because it's just a natural substance that's available everywhere. I'm going to skip the Billy Rubin story because of time problems. So, screening for treatment is now a phenomenal growth industry. The American College of Medical Genetics in 2005 recommended adding 54 tests to the newborn screening panel because of the advent of tandem mass spectrometry, which made it cheap and easy to screen for 50 or 100 or however many tests you wanted on a single drop of blood. Of these 54 tests that they recommended, 25 produced abnormalities that were not to, known to cause any disease. That is, they were simply abnormality and abnormalities biochemical abnormalities, and nobody knew what the clinical significance was, but they recommended testing. For 24 of the tests, they were known to be associated with disease, but nobody knew what the sensitivity or specificity of the test was, how many false positives, false negatives, and the treatments for these disorders were largely untested. Yet, the National Institutes of Child Health, on the recommendation of the ACMG panel, same chair of both panels, recommended, supported this recommendation to add these tests to newborn blood spots. I want to just give you one example of the consequence of this recommendation. Here's a disease called MBAD. It's an extraordinarily rare disorder of isoleucine metabolism, causing severe mental retardation, failure to thrive, seizures, and death. <clears throat> uh, by 2004, there had been eight cases in the world. Pretty rare. Um, Wisconsin, in 2001, uh, pioneered and became the first state to start screening for embed. And in four years, uh, Wisconsin discovered 23 cases. 
Uh, well, you say, that's great. I mean, here's a screening program that's picking up this what was thought to be a rare disease. The interesting part was that all of the cases were in families of Hmong descent. as an instance of one in 200 births, which would make it one of the most common, maybe the most common genetic disorder, other than maybe sickle cell disease. Fortunately for these children, their parents didn't believe in Western medicine, uh, had no interest in complying with the recommended diet, and none of these children received any treatment. Um, five to ten years later now, close follow-up of these children show that they're all normal. One has a mild speech delay, which probably has nothing to do with the metabolic abnormality. Um, none of them has been on the diet, as I think I said. Uh, compliance was not poor, it was absent. But all these children were labeled with a life-threatening illness. Their parents were told, your child is seriously ill and he or she is going to die if you don't put them on a diet. Well, this is the worst test imaginable. That is, it has a 100% false positive rate in the first 10 years, at least, of its use. Um, it has no true positives. I think if we keep doing it, I think in a 1,000 years, we'll probably find a case. Um, and that child will get on a diet and will be helped. But in the meantime, thousands of children will be falsely labeled. Some will go on this diet for life, and who knows what the complications of that will be. This is exactly the same problem as the PKU problem. An assumption that this was a homogeneous disorder that a single test could detect. Um, very zealous political advocates to stamp out these rare causes of death, lobbying. Um, to have it tested for, no scientific studies, no systematic <clears throat> review, no standards for informed consent. Um, this now is going completely out of control and will be the subject of, I think, Laney Ross's talk, because as you all know, the Genome Project has now identified a thousand or more genes associated with disorders, whether they're diseases or not, is uncertain. Conditions whose natural history is unknown, um, conditions for which the benefits and risks of treating the phenotype are unknown. <clears throat> Gene therapy, of course, is still a dream. Um, we've known what the basic defect in sickle cell disease was since 1945, and there hasn't been one angstrom unit of progress in finding a <clears throat> molecular-based treatment for that. And yet the National Institutes of Child Health in 2005 sent out a request for proposals to figure out a way to screen for these thousand conditions with a single microarray chip. So that um, uh, I have almost no doubt that that's going to happen. And um, every parent in the country will get a letter in the mail saying, congratulations, your son slash daughter has 207 recessive conditions and 11 dominant conditions. We have no idea what this means or what to do about it, but have a nice day. <laughs> And by the way, your pediatrician won't know any more about it than you do. <clears throat> in summary, <clears throat> I think the future of newborn screening will be like the past and present of newborn screening. That new tests and treatments will be introduced with little information on test characteristics, the natural history of the disorder, or the safety and efficacy of the interventions. Many children will be harmed from false labeling and stigmatization, and in some cases, harmful treatments. Some will be helped, we just won't know who they are. We just won't know who really had a disease and who didn't. <clears throat> and so when normal, healthy children come out of this program, it will be very difficult to know if they were children who were destined to be healthy anyway and simply survive the treatment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Faust. Our second speaker is Mark Mercurio. Mark is the director of the Yale uh, Pediatric Ethics Program, associate professor uh, at Yale University School of Medicine, and a neonatologist at the Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. He's coming up to the podium, so I will abbreviate his uh, uh, introduction. No, no, that, that's fine. I don't, I'm not sure this crowd knows you uh, as well as, as they might. So let's just take another minute to to tell you he's uh, the director it's based on a true story <laughs> of um, medical ethics courses for the physicians associates and pediatric residents and he's a member of the executive committee for the Yale University <coughs> Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics his academic work is focused on ethical issues in pediatrics particularly in the newborn period and Mark's title is the future of ethics in neonatology please welcome Mark Mercurio.
So does, does anybody here remember Al Spangler? Nobody here in Chicago? So Al, Al Spangler was a baseball, he came to mind a few minutes ago. Al Spangler was a base. I grew up in Chicago, and he was a baseball player on the Cubs. He was not a remarkable, necessarily remarkable player. He had zero, he was a nice guy, he had a zero home runs. So um, as the story goes, at one point he was standing with uh, Ernie Banks and Willie Mays and said, you know something guys, between the three of us, we have over a thousand home runs. <laughs> and I thought of that when, when Mark said that we have here a collection of, of, uh, of some of the finest pediatric bioethicists in the country, and I thought, as the Al Spangler of the group, I'd hear to say, absolutely, we do. Um, so I'm here to talk about the future of, of uh, ethics in neonatology. Interestingly enough, just this month, the AAP Vision of Pediatric 2020 Task Force published a paper about the future. They identified eight megatrends, and I thought that two of them were interesting, and in keeping with what I wanted to talk about today. One, the dynamics of the pediatric workforce, and the other about ongoing medical advances. They also discussed what they called wicked problems, which has kind of a nice New England sound to it, so I thought I'd bring it here as a tribute to John Paris. So, a lot of people don't even know what I look like without the beard. <laughs> but this, this was, uh, and this doesn't help. Uh, so the pediatric workforce back in the day when I was training in neonatology in particular, this is, uh, this is what most, not all, we weren't all quite this handsome, but this was your pediatric workforce, uh, your neonatology workforce in particular. But we can do better than this. This, these are the fellows, the neonatology fellows and first year attendings uh, at Yale University. And you'll notice um, that they are all women. And this is a huge trend in the pediatric workforce, to be sure, over the past generation and will be into the future, it would seem, um, and certainly in neonatology. And we've seen this shift. So what does this really have to do with anything ethical? Well, I don't know. Will this have any effect on the way ethics is done in the future? And the answer is maybe. Um, the picture on the bottom is Roz Ladd, who's a philosopher uh, at Brown University in recent years, and she was one of my mentors. And uh, she got me to stop thinking just in terms of principle-based ethics and to think more broadly and introduced me to the work of Carol Gilligan, among others, who in 1982 had written The Voice, and that's uh, Professor Gilligan on the top slide, wrote a book in a different voice. And in this book, she pointed out that it would seem at the time, based on her work, that young women did ethics, if you will, differently than young men. That the emphasis was more on relationships and less on a principle-based approach and the emphasis was greatly on decisions within the social context. Now, were those findings truly valid? Were they nature versus nurture? Are they relevant today or in the future? I'm not here to tell you. I think it's an interesting question, though, when we consider the future of ethics in neonatology, because if I walk into the ICU and ask myself, what's different from the past? What's different is that the young people in charge are nearly all women. Is that going to affect the way ethics is done in neonatology? I don't know. It's an interesting question. The, the work of Carol Gilligan and many others suggests that it, that, that it might. So that's one thought on the, among the megatrends. The other was the new technologies that I wanted to mention on this. They identified uh, wicked problems and said these are going to be messy, multifaceted, and multi-system. They will lack clear-cut solutions and are insoluble by conventional means. Uh, well, for pediatric ethicists, and I suspect for most ethicists, this is just another day at work. Um, but they had commented, and the AAP had commented, that this is going to require ongoing in-depth dialogues or permanent strategic confrontations that confront status quo assumptions. To which I say, amen. I think that the status quo, or the standard of care, has stood to be uh, a tremendous enemy to not just progress, but to ethical evaluations. The way that so the status quo, and I think Norm touched on this a bit too, the status quo reaches a certain uh, elevated, exalted status, and it becomes very difficult to get away from. I would suggest to you that this in medicine, not just in ethics, but in medicine, we have the standard of care. And we say that for this particular treatment, when we're deciding about pharmacology, there's a standard of care. I would suggest that our obligation to adhere to that standard of care, the strength of that standard of care, is based on the evidence that supports it. 
Specifically, um, the, if there are randomized controlled trials, if there are no decent trials, are there at least um, good physiologic reasons to believe that would be the appropriate treatment? There's an analogy to be made, not a perfect analogy, but an analogy to be made with ethical issues. I would suggest to you that the standard of care with regard to ethical questions in pediatrics, should we resuscitate this group of patients, should we provide this technology to this patient, that the standard of care is only as strong as, or should only be viewed as strong as, the ethical reasoning that stands behind it. And so often the ethical reasoning is based simply on, well here we see, this is the Yale symbol here, Lux et Veritas, I put that there. For those of you who read Latin, Lux et Veritas means because we say so. Um, and, and that, unfortunately, is so much of what the standard of care is built upon. I think what the future holds, hopefully what the future holds, is communication, evaluation, and consensus regarding the use of new technologies and old ones, and considering the ethical reasoning or rationale behind use or non-use of a given technology. And a case in point specifically, bringing us up to the present over the past couple decades, is ECMO. So this is a study done uh, by our group. Um, I was the senior author on this, but the, all the other authors were the ECMO team at Yale. We surveyed all ECMO centers in the ELSO registry, so everybody who's doing ECMO, 81 of 124 centers responded. And we found out many things about what's done, and a tremendous disagreement over some of the basics. What's the lowest gestational age that it's safe to do ECMO at, or would you do ECMO at? Tremendous disagreements. Do patients who have had an intracranial hemorrhage, are they still candidates for ECMO? No consensus. How much of these things actually been discussed? Somebody set up standards way back when, and the standards, some people follow them, some don't. But with regard to ethical questions, among the other questions we asked in this survey was how often would you seek to override parental refusal of ECMO for a neonate you feel is likely to survive with a favor favorable neurodevelopmental outcome if he received the proposed treatment? This is some, seems to me like a fundamental ethical question. So if parents say no and you really think ECMO is the best thing for the child, how often would you seek to override them? So this is what represents a consensus. I don't know if you can read it. That's never, rarely, sometimes, usually, or always. This is ECMO as is currently offered in, in, mainly in the United States where most of the centers are, but in the UK and, and elsewhere as well. You can see that the never or rarely group is almost the same size as the usually or always group. There is no consensus on this. There has been no discussion of this. So the future of ethics in neonatology holds, if we want it, a discussion about this question, a discussion about new technologies in general, not just what they should cost or how we should plug them in, but a discussion about when they should be used and about how they should be applied in ethically murky situations. Now for the bad news. The big problem in ethics in neonatology, borderline viability, that will still be with us. It's an old wicked problem, but it's not going anywhere. Just two months ago, the NICHD and Neonatal Network, so 21 major academic centers in the country, um, published recent data and showed us that survival at 23 weeks was 26%, and survival at 22 weeks was 6%. So this shows us kind of where the edge of viability is for these newborns. Now the line may move, it may not move, but what to do at the edge is going to remain a difficult question and one we need to face. What I'm hopeful for in the coming years is that we will address openly and consistently the self-fulfilling prophecy. So not long ago, when trying to figure out what to do about this, I talked to a colleague from another center, a bright guy, and I asked him, what do you guys do about 22 weeks? I said, do you guys resuscitate at 22 weeks? And he said, no, we never do. I said, oh, good, someone's thought this through and figured it out. I said, well, why not? He said, because we've never had a survivor. Yeah, you can use that argument at 26 weeks. <laughs> so here's the fascinating question. At 22 weeks, for example, or 26 weeks, at 23 weeks, 26% survive. But mind you, they tried to save two-thirds of those kids, 68%. At 22 weeks, only 6% survive. But it was only attempted, resuscitation was only attempted in 19%. It doesn't make sense to say it doesn't work because we don't try. Therefore, it doesn't work. 
This is not limited just to extreme prematurity. And by the way, just as a point of information, there are still centers, many in the United States, that will tell people it's impossible to survive if being born at 22 weeks. I'm not here to tell you that it's likely or that it's advisable. This is a, a, a whole nother talk, as they say. Uh, we could get into that. Except to say that when we say it's impossible, when we say it, that it simply ignores the fact that it's only impossible if you've never tried. For those who try, it seems like it is sometimes possible. Moreover, by the way, in Japan, where they are very aggressive at 22 weeks, the survival uh, for a large series, multi-center series, was over 30%. Doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. It means that for us just to say it's impossible is fundamentally you know, wrong and dishonest. But the problem is not just what about the edge. The problem is also about just using gestational age. John Tyson and the network showed us in a paper published a couple of years ago that we shouldn't just be talking about gestational age because that's not all that predicts how these kids are going to do. The girls do better than the boys. Bigger kids do better than smaller kids. Singletons do better than multiple gestations. Kids who got antenatal steroids do better than kids who didn't. So what we find is that on the left you see a boy who's a twin who didn't get his steroids. His chance of survival is 9%. If he's put on a ventilator, which kind of gets to the question of uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy a bit, it's better, it's 14%. His chances of survival without neurodevelopmental impairment is only 3%. Now, on the right, you see a girl who's a little bit bigger, but she's only 22 weeks. Her chance of survival is 11%, but if she's put on a ventilator, and remember that the vast majority of kids at 22 weeks, no one even tries, if she's put on a ventilator, her chance of survival is actually 30%. Chance of survival without neurodevelopmental impairment is 11 percent. You can see that there would be a fundamental injustice for us to tell the parents at 22 weeks resuscitation is not an option for this girl, but at 23 weeks it's an option if you want it. And the same thing holds at the other end, at 24, 25 weeks. That if we just use gestation age alone, there will be a fundamental injustice because kids who actually have a better chance of survival will be denied that chance. Or you could look at it the other way and say parents suffer an injustice because at 22 weeks those parents were given a choice. Um, at 23 weeks, they would as well. But as we get to 24, 25 weeks, where do we no longer give parents a choice and just say the resuscitation is obligatory? We run into the same problem where we remove parental uh, preference. We remove their control, I think, in an unjust fashion as well. So hopefully, as advised by John Tyson and others, we will move beyond gestational age when we have these conversations. Now we're going to have the same problem, but with different diseases. Trisomy 13 and 18 has entered the conversation and in the next decade will be big in the conversation. These children um, almost never survive past the first month of life. Some do, most don't. Um, the question is raised, well, do they not survive because we don't try to save them? Often they have heart disease such as VSD. What if we tried to save them all? It's the fundamental question. When parents ask you whatever a diagnosis is, what are the chances he could survive? They're not asking the fundamental question. They're not asking, what are the chances he could survive if he didn't try anything? They're asking, what are the chances he could survive if we tried everything we knew how? And just because they're not savvy enough to ask it, by the way, doesn't mean that we're not obligated to try and address it, even if sometimes the answer is, I don't know. Well, the question that has come up again and again, you've got to be kidding me, two minutes, okay. The question that has come up again and again is trisomy 13 and 18. These kids are going to have significant, major, major cognitive deficits. Should they be offered uh, cardiac surgery? Some centers do it and some don't. When I raised this issue with a large leadership group in neonatology, one of the common responses was, can we please just not talk about it? Let's just stay away from this. Why does neonatology get a separate session when we're talking about the future of ethics in pediatrics? Uh, I don't know, but thank you in any case. I would say that perhaps one reason is that this is one group where people are still arguing over whether or not our patients are persons. Regardless of their mental, uh, of their future mental status, their current mental situation. It occurred to me some years ago when I encountered a case of a child who uh, was two months, less than two months old. And this child had a ter terrible, terrible uh, uh, congenital defect. And it was predicted to have profound cognitive deficits forever. It was going to function at the level of a two month old at the best etc. And it was determined that it was acceptable to withhold artificial nutrition and hydration in that setting. 
Not long after that, a conversation was had about a girl who was older, maybe six or eight years old, who had the same deficit, who came in with a pneumonia, and they were talking about what should or shouldn't be done, and I asked the question years ago as a lad, well, are we going to uh, offer the parents the option of withholding artificial nutrition and hydration? People looked at me like I was crazy. This kid has what you were afraid the other kid's probably going to have, but for the baby, it's acceptable, but for the older kid, it's not. It's fascinating, there, and there's evidence to show, which we won't have time to get into, that people see the lives of a newborn, particularly the preterm newborn, as in some ways more optional. Resuscitation, for example, with the same progno with prognosis is considered uh, less obligatory in the newborn than it is in older kids. This has been shown. I think some people in the audience have taken part in these studies. Years ago, I wrote on the question of saving versus creating. Is it because when there's an older child, who has a near drowning in a swimming pool and has major neurologic deficit, we think that that's a child that we are saving. But in the newborn unit, when there's a child who's born and has a severe cognitive deficit, that that's a child that we're somehow creating, we take more responsibility for. It's a fascinating question. This is a fundamental question that we're going to get to. And in this decade, if I want to be an optimist, and why not, this is something we need to talk about, the moral status of newborns as compared to older children. We've been talking around it and around it, and I will tell you that good academic neonatologists will say, I tried to talk about this once with, some, with the Ethics Committee, and they wanted to talk about personhood and stuff like this. Who has time for that crap? Well, we need to take the time. So finally, um, what's going to happen in the future? In the future, in many ways, clinical ethics education is going to come of age. The first generation is going to come of age. Most members of my generation who are now uh, the leadership positions in academic medicine and in clinical medicine in general are held by people of my generation, some a bit older, some a bit younger. Most of them had no real ethics education in medical school. Some did, but most did not. But for many years now, we have been teaching clinical ethics. And that, in the future, those who are exposed to this, these people who as residents, and this is, I come to the mecca of clinical ethics education, that. These disciples now will be in charge. I think what should come of this, if we've done a good job, is that ethical analysis of clinical problems will become increasingly accepted. It'll become something that everybody buys into as part of the natural discussion, part of the essential discussion of the cases we consider, if we've done a good job. If we just turn them off to the whole subject, it's not going to make things better or worse. It's not going to make things better. It will make them worse. One other question about ethics education is, could it make things worse? And I would say the answer is yes, it could. Yes, it could make things worse. And here to tell us why is Alexander Pope, who would tell us, first of all, that there's no substitute for a good head of hair. <laughs> and though I'm not sure that's really his hair. Um, and who said, and we read it in high school, that a little learning is a dangerous thing. He was talking about the period in spring where all knowledge comes from in Greek mythology. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not of the Pyrian spring. Their shallow drafts intoxicate the brain while drinking deeply sobers us again. The risk in doing ethics education is we give ourselves and our students shallow drafts. We need, my friends, to drink deeply. And we need to drink deeply together and with our students. And then I think ethics education, as those who have been exposed to it, take over, not just this, the, I know I'm preaching to the choir, or if we're talking about drinking deeply, maybe I'm preaching to the fraternity here, but the point is that those who don't come to ethics conferences, they need to see this as a fundamental part of their job, and they need to have uh, to gone beyond the surface, to gone past the four principles, which I think are marvelous and which I teach. But we need to drink more deeply uh, with our students. That's the future, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Our third speaker is Lainey Ross. Lainey's the Carolyn and Matthew Buxbaum Professor of Pediatrics here at the UFC. And uh, she is uh, currently serving on the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections, fondly known as SACR, the American College of Medical Genetics, um, Social Ethics and Legal Issues Transplant 
Committee and the Ethics Committee of UNOS, the United Network of Organ Sharing. Laney is going to circle back to the topic that Norm began us with, a very important one in pediatric ethics, the future of pediatric genetic testing. Thank you, Laney. Um, when I thought about what is the future of pediatric genetic testing, I asked myself, and the answer is newborn profiling. And this is actually a great thing for the future of pediatrics because all of the people who are adult doctors, you also have to think about it because before we do newborn profiling, we're going to be doing profiling on adults. <coughs> so what is genetic profiling? It's actually the analysis of your entire genome in order to reveal the majority of your genetic variations, and it can be done any time in the life cycle. In fact, 99.8% of all of us have the same genetic information, and what we're going to be focusing on is that 0.2% where we're different. And those are called SNPs, and you get some small variations, but when you have 3 billion base pairs, a 99.8% similarity means we have about a million differences. Um, currently, only two famous people actually have their entire genome published and they are Dr. James Watson and Craig Venter. We've actually done about six or eight of them in the whole world. More will be coming. This is a graph that actually shows the timeline. When we first started the Human Genome Project and it was launched, it took $3 billion to sequence, but in about 2007, we were able to do it for about several million, and the plan is by 2010, 2012, we're gonna be down to about 5,000, and everyone talks about the future being the $1,000 genome. Newborn genetic profiling is not newborn screening. Um, Norm may suggest that this is the future of newborn screening, um, and it may be, but newborn screening, as Norm has shown, um, identifies both genetic conditions as well as non-genetic conditions, hypothyroidism, and it's gone beyond that. It's doing hearing screening, and most recently, there's even been a suggestion, for example, of doing um, cardiac testing in the newborn period. Newborn screening, at least prior to tandem mass spectrometry, which is what Norm focused on, focused on conditions for which early diagnosis reduced the risk of morbidity and mortality. Newborn profiling actually is not going to just be looking for diseases. It will discover some, uncover some diseases, some that will present in childhood, some that will present later on. Um, but it's actually focused on looking at genotypes and not phenotypes. So it's trying to look at all of our variations and how they may interact, how they may lead to disease, but how they may also lead to many other aspects of our lives, um, some things that we might call recreational genetics, um, whether we're the type of person who's thrill-seeking and things of that sort. Um, and what we need to know, and it's actually true in disease genes but also in all other genes, is that genotype does not equal phenotype, meaning that um, we're going to learn a lot about genetic variation. Norm is 100% right. There is no such thing anymore as a simple Mendelian condition. Newborn profiling is also not the genetic multiplex testing that already exists on these um, uh, gene chips because, again, those are focusing on rare conditions. Um, but what we're really looking for here um, with uh, multiplex testing is, again, looking for very specific genetic mutations. Um, by contrast, genetic profiling is going to focus on genetic mutations whether or not they're associated with health. So what will newborn genetic profiling look like? It'll be mapping all of three billion base pairs of children at birth, probably using the sample from the newborn blood spot. At right now, it's going to be a real investment in time and money, but that, those costs are going to decrease, and it is going to be less than $1,000 within the decade. The interesting thing is that will make it that we'll no longer actually store newborn blood spots. We will actually just do the entire genetic profile, and we'll store it in a database. And storing three billion base pairs will cost cents. And so once you've done the test, it'll be there, and it'll be there for the rest of your life. Um, and that actually raises huge issues of who's going to be able to open it for what purposes and things of that sort. So what genetic profiling will not be, here's a cartoon. As you can see from your genetic printout, you only think you're depressed, whereas you are, in fact, a jolly, happy, full of joy, spring-type person. That's not what genetic profiling is going to be. It's not going to be able to predict health or behavior. It's more likely to be able to describe propensities. We're going to be talking a lot about odds ratios. We're not going to be talking about diagnostics. Um, that we're going to come to understand a lot more the role of other factors, including social, <coughs> economic, and environmental factors. 
Um, and our understanding of these interactions right now are at a primitive level. And that's going to be my one caution, because we are talking about newborn profiling, but we really need to be thinking about it in the adult world. We should have adults as our research subjects first. So what are the benefits of profiling? The first, as I've already pointed out, we can generate this data one time, and it'll be cheaper in the long run. It will not require getting repeat samples, and it can be stored quite cheaply. Um, it will allow us to understand much more fully the genotype-phenotype correlations and the genotype environmental interactions at the society level. So right now we know that there are over 1,600 mutations in the cystic fibrosis gene, and we know that some of them um, are quite mild, and some lead to pancreatic insufficiency, and some lead to lung disease, and some lead to very minimal symptoms or just male infertility. So we've come to learn single gene disorder, quite variability in a phenotype. And then we're also going to learn a lot more about genotype environment. And these are all always plus minuses. If you realize you don't have the genotype that will lead to lung cancer, does that mean that smoking becomes OK? There's also the benefits of profiling is that the real hope and why we're doing it is that the hope is that the, gen the data generated will be used throughout our lifetime to tailor our prevention and therapies. Right? So we're thinking about pharmacogenetics, but we're also thinking about Given that we know what our risk factors are, how much sleep, how much exercise, what do we really need to eat, and that it can be personalized and tailored to the individual. But when we're talking about in the newborn world, we're then assuming that informing parents of increased risk will motivate changes in lifestyle. I always view genetic testing, I always call it the New Year's resolution, because everyone says, if I knew that my teens did X, that I would change my behavior to Y, and we all know how long our New Year's resolutions last. Um, but it could, I mean, in, in the ideal, it could allow us to modify a lifestyle st starting early regarding adult health problems, because we will know what we're at risk for in adults. We know that adult health problems begin in, in pediatrics, in fact, before pediatrics in utero. But what are the risks of profiling? Um, one concern is genetic determinism, belief that our health and behavior can be explained solely by our genes. There are going to be psychosocial harms. Uh, being in many ways what Norm was saying, but at a much larger scale because the significance of results in low-risk populations may be different than similar results. So again, there's not going to be as much focus on these single gene disorders. It's going to be multiple genetic environmental interaction disorders. And what a gene means in a high-risk family may be very different from what that gene means in a very low-risk family. And we may be creating much more um, anxiety than we need to and may be giving people wrong information. There's also the potential of discrimination harms, misuse by insurers, employers, and schools. We may be seeing this currently today with the NCAA policy of testing all athletes for sickle cell trait. Um, and of course, the, the beauty um, and the burden of genetic testing is that they run in families. And the implications when one person gets profiled for other family members. Other risks of profiling is particularly in the, in the newborn period is that parents now will have access to health risks that may not express in their children for decades, and then what right does the child have to privacy as an adult? Since genotype-phenotype correlations are really poorly understood, um, and we will then find things that we think we know today are true will be disproven, and this may lead parents to overreact, seek unproven therapies, and again, as Norm suggested, do more harm than good. We also now have a concept of pleiotropy, which is that some genetic changes um, which we thought were only associated with one disorder are actually associated with more. And the classic example here is APOE, which actually we think about with respect to um, Alzheimer's disease, but it's also relevant to cardiac disease, autoimmune disorders, what type of uh, long-term implications you will have after head trauma, um, and many other conditions. And so you could imagine that if a family wanted to know a child's APOE status because of cardiac risk, um, it's also, though, giving them information about their child as an adult and risk for Alzheimer's. Um, and so how do you tell parents only part of the information um, or knowing that they'll just go on the web and find out all of its other implications? So why are people even talking about profiling when there's so much unknown and we really don't understand uh, we're really in infancy in the sense of understanding genotype, phenotype correlations, and the answer is because newborns are convenient. They spend 24 to 48 hours as a captive population in the hospital. 
Um, and so the pro for that perspective, and the reason why newborn screening has been mandatory, is because it ensures equal access. And yet currently, given that such screening is not clinically useful, not talking about newborn screening here, talking about newborn profiling, it can only be used for research purposes, so the ar access arguments of equal access are much weaker. The big con and the big fear is that data security systems are not 100% secure, and it will be critical to have these before we start uh, testing all newborns. But there are special problems in profiling newborns. There's the issue of informed consent. Should there be uh, constraints on parental requests for data? So remember, if we profile, we're collecting all three billion base pairs, and it now all exists. And the fact is, no one's going to stare at three billion base pairs. They're going to say, I'm worried about condition X, or I'm worried about this. Let's look at that part of the, um, of the profile. And the question is, will there be limits on what parents can look at? Will we restrict them to only looking at conditions that are going to present in childhood? Most genetic statements that currently exist say we shouldn't be testing children for late onset conditions, so we could restrict parental access to conditions that uh, only pertain to health and childhood. Most genetic statements also argue, though, against giving parents any carrier information because it's about the child's reproductive his um, history, future reproductive plans, and yet all newborn screening programs inform parents when carriers are found both in sickle cell disease and cystic fibrosis. Um, and often using the argument that it will actually inform the parents of their own risks, uh, so using the child as a canary in the coal mine. Um, of course, this information may also reveal misattributed paternity. Another special problem in profiling newborns is the question of, since it is research, and traditionally we always have said we should do research on adults who can consent for themselves, um, Maybe we should be thinking about doing it with adults. Again, the big advantage of newborns is they are a captive population. It does raise these special issues about who should have access to it and by whom, and it's going to be very difficult to draw the lines as we realize that things aren't about adult onset or childhood onset conditions, but that it's all over a continuum. Um, and finally, there's going to be this need to deny access to the parents when the child becomes an adult. So it's not like we're going to be able to hand parents a, a, a CD disk carrying the three billion base pair information because if we do, then parents have this information about their child when they're adults, when these individuals have a right to privacy against them. And the interesting thing is insurers are clearly going to be interested in those three billion base pairs, but they're also going to be interested in environmental data as in genetic data. And much of this will end up being stored in biobanks where we're trying to collect as much information as possible to understand genetic environmental um, interactions and so risks of discrimination and stigmatization are real and we need to be really careful about how we think about creating these databases. The, the last set of issues that are, are special problems in profiling newborns is what do we do when this child reaches adulthood? Can the child withdraw? In a sense, can the child say, you know what, I no longer want everyone being able to access my three billion base pairs. Of course they exist, they've already been in multiple different records and databases, and it's not going to be clear what it means to withdraw from any research using genetics that, that ends up in databases. Uh, we, we have huge issues of confidentiality and privacy. How do you secure, ensure secure databases over a lifetime? We're going to have to answer questions about who has the right to know, who has, who has the right to access this information. And then the concern is to what extent can we keep this secure within the healthcare world, or to what extent is it going to end up being used for forensic purposes, for employment purposes, and for other non-medical uses? So, in summary, clearly many issues need to be addressed before newborn genetic profiling should become routine. I'm going to end with this cartoon. Embryonic DNA tests indicate a future domestic terrorist. You may choose late-term lethal injection or the electric height chair. And the bottom of the cartoon says, waiting for ethics to catch up with science. It will be important to address these issues before large-scale routine newborn genetic profiling is adopted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lainey. Mark was uh, good enough to open the door to a baseball analogy. So um, I will introduce our last uh, speaker as a cleanup hitter. He is John Lantos. He is the director of pediatric bioethics at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. And he spent a few years down here at the South Side. And um, his uh, talk is entitled, Do We Still Need Pediatricians? And I hope the answer will be yes. <laughs>
It's always great to uh, follow Norm Faust because I sometimes think of myself as a cynical and pessimistic person. <laughs> but now I feel positively Reagan-esque. I mean, it's morning in America. Uh, I also, with trepidation, want to correct Norm. Uh, and I'm usually wrong when I correct Norm and will find by noon 18 messages in my email box with documentation, but I think the Yogi Berra quote is, predictions are hard, especially about the future. Okay. Um, there's a scene in a novel by Erwin Yalom, the name of the novel is When Nietzsche Wept, in which Dr. Joseph Brauer, one of the pioneers of psychoanalysis, tries to convince Friedrich Nietzsche to have himself admitted to the hospital under Brauer's care. The situation is a little complicated. Brower has agreed to see Nietzsche only after getting a letter from a woman he doesn't know named Lou Salabang, asking him to see Nietzsche and suggesting that the future of German philosophy hangs in the balance. Brower had never heard of Nietzsche nor of this woman, though she would be, go on to become a sort of late 19th century combination of Angelina Jolie and Martha Nussbaum. <laughs> beautiful, brilliant, controversial headline grabbing and romantically entangled with some of the most famous and brilliant men of her time. Salome, though, has heard of Brouwer, particularly of his fledgling experiments with a talking cure for patients suffering from mental illness. She knows that Nietzsche, who had once been her lover, is suffering from both excruciating migraines and depression that's interfering with his work as a philosopher. So she wants Brewer to take him on to treat his migraines, Brewer's a neurologist, but then sneak him into this new psychotherapy in order to help him deal with his depression. Nietzsche, as might be expected, does not want any medical treatment. After all, his worldview suggests that whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger, so his task is to overcome pain and suffering, not to relieve it. He is a patient from hell, extremely sick, manifestly suffering, but also extremely unwilling to allow Brower to do anything except crisis intervention for his migraines. He also senses correctly that Brower is himself having a sort of midlife crisis, partly as the result of his discovery of psychoanalysis and his work with his young protege, Sigmund Freud, through which he's starting to explore his own motivations for doing the things he does. At one point, Nietzsche challenges Brewer's motivations. Why, he asks, is Brewer so intent on helping him? Brewer, obviously full of secrets and secret resistances to exploring such questions, replies, you come to me for help, I offer it. I am a doctor, that's what I do. Far too simple, Nietzsche answers back. Both of us know that human motivation is far more complex and at the same time more primitive. I ask again, what's your motivation? It's a simple matter, Professor Nietzsche. One practices one's profession. A cobbler cobbles, a baker bakes, a doctor doctors. One earns one's living, one practices one's calling, and my calling is to be of service, to alleviate pain. Those are not satisfactory answers to my question, Dr. Brewer. When you say a doctor doctors, a baker bakes, that is not motivation, that is habit. You omitted from your answer consciousness, choice, self-interest. I prefer it when you say one earns one's living, that at least one can understand. One strives to put food in one's stomach but you don't request money from me. Mm, I might pose the same question to you, Professor Nietzsche. You say you earn nothing from your work. Why, therefore, do you philosophize? Ah, Nietzsche was ready for this. There's one important distinction between us. I do not claim that I philosophize for you, whereas you, doctor, continue to prevent, pretend that your motivation is to serve me, to alleviate my pain, such claims have nothing to do with human motivation. They are part of the slave mentality artfully engineered by priestly propaganda. Dissect your motives deeper. You will find that no one has ever done anything holy for others. All actions are self-directed. All service is self-serving. And all love, self-loving. 
Nietzsche's challenge to Brewer resonates for all of medicine, but particularly for pediatrics today. Why do we do what we do, and how do we know where to focus? How does it change as technology changes? Pediatricians take care of children. It's what we do, but how exactly do we do that, or should we do that? What sorts of problems in which children, and to what end? The answers are by no means obvious and become less obvious as children in general enjoy better health and less disease. Where most children are uh, in a world where most children are healthy, but where those who are sick have rare diseases that are expensive to treat and usually can be treated with only partial success. Pediatrics, much more than any other field in medicine, surgery, obstetrics, is in a peculiar historical moment. In all those fields, the burden of disease is increasing, not decreasing. People are living longer, and as they live longer, they are sicker and more weighed down by the burdens of chronic and complex disease. There are more things to treat, and they are more complicated to treat. Obstetrics may be an exception. It's a little complicated. Pregnant women have better outcomes, but they're uh, uh, obstetrics has, has achieved its success in ways that differ from pediatrics. They haven't eliminated diseases. They've found complex medical interventions to alleviate problems. In pediatrics, by contrast, our efforts at prevention have been phenomenally successful. Many of the most common diseases that I treated as a resident just 30 years ago do not exist, are virtually non-existent today. Children today don't get chicken pox. They don't get H. flu meningitis. They don't get epiglottitis. We never see pneumococcal bacteremia. Rotavirus is on the way out. And even the ones that still do exist, uh, the treatment has changed. We don't treat otitis anymore. It gets better by itself. It's all viral. Uh, rheumatic fever? Uh, Main thing pediatricians do, culture those throats. Oh, oh. We still do it, but the number of cases of rheumatic fever uh, has dropped dramatically for reasons nobody understands. So to ask whether we still need pediatricians or to think about the implications for ethics is really to ask what the pediatrics of the future will be. Now, oddly, in spite of the success of pediatrics, and the, uh, the energy that goes into it has not decreased. Everywhere, people are building these new children's hospitals that are stunning palaces to something bigger, fancier, more technologically sophisticated than ever before, with double beds for parents to sleep in and 42-inch flat-screen TVs where you can order room service on the touch screen. And, What's done in these wonderful new facilities? Well, everybody knows that about half of what's done is neonatal or neonatal related. Uh, fully half of all admissions in most tertiary care academic centers are either NICU bed days or uh, bed days for uh, NICU follow-up. So we could imagine uh, one trend for the future of pediatrics is everything else will get smaller, NICU will get bigger, they'll start saving 22 and 20 one weekers and children's hospitals will become large NICUs. Bill will be very happy. The rest of us will kill ourselves. <laughs> but imagine an alternative future, which seems not entirely uh, unimaginable, that we will make some progress in figuring out how to prevent or at least lower the prevalence of prematurity. And so maybe there will be half the number of extreme preemies uh, as before. In developed countries, then, the leading causes of death uh, beyond prematurity are congenital anomalies and trauma of one sort or another. The causes of trauma vary, motor vehicle accidents, child abuse, homicide, and suicide in adolescence. Both trauma and congenital anomalies have three possible outcomes. Children either die, completely recover, or are left with lifelong disabilities and chronic health problems. Now, we have a name for these impaired survivors, children with special health care needs. And there are studies of how many they are, what they need, how they do in various health delivery systems. And they need a lot. They need attentive medical attention, attentive social work, nutrition, psychology, physical therapy. Their care during adolescence is enormously challenging. Our pediatric health care system as designed today is not very good at taking care of these. Our children's hospitals are designed primarily for crisis intervention, but not the long-term management that these kids need. They need 
pediatricians, but a different sort of pediatricians than the ones we have been training to date. And they comprise maybe 5 to 10 percent of all children in the United States. The other 90 percent have very different needs. They need the panoply of preventive treatments that have been developed over the years and that are partly responsible for the worldwide outbreak of pediatric health. So any student of public health will tell us that it's not really the medical interventions, it's economic growth and better sanitation and limitations on family size and all that, which certainly are uh, a large part uh, of the reason for improved child health. But for this discussion, it doesn't really matter. These children, too, need a different type of pediatrician and pediatric health system than the one we have now and the one in which we now train our young pediatricians. They need convenient, affordable, point-of-service care. They need ready telephone or internet access to knowledgeable professionals who can help them sift through the information on what preventive treatments make sense, what signs need uh, attention, and how to deal with the psychosocial problems that are the bulk of the problems these children face. Anxiety, bedwetting, temper tantrums, school problems, obesity, smoking sexual activity during early adolescence, etc. And their parents need genetic counselors to help them deal with the information that Laney was talking about that is about to be coming online in, and to think about the sophisticated gene screen tests that will be offered either by their doctors or direct to consumer for 35 bucks on the internet. But in any event, they don't need doctors with the skills that we teach most doctors today in most pediatric residency programs. So why don't we train the pediatricians, uh, why don't we train pediatricians to face the problems of the future? I come back to Nietzsche's question to Dr. Brewer, what's in it for us? And this reflects a little bit on the panel we heard yesterday. We're caught in systems of education and systems of finance and systems of professionalization that simply cannot adjust to the problems of today or tomorrow. We continue to train pediatricians who are good at responding exquisitely well to the physiologic crises of individual patients. And that's an important task and an important part of pediatrics. But it cannot be the main part if our goal is to promote and protect the health of children generally. For that, we'd need a different approach altogether, but one for which today there is no business model for either medical education or health services delivery. Even the bioethics questions, as asked, primarily make jobs for bioethicists. Who should have access to genetic information? What sort of policies should we develop? Where should we set the threshold for resuscitation? Implies that we are the ones who get to set the threshold. But it seems like what's going to happen in the future as more information is available is people will start to make end runs around this stultified and stultifying uh, delivery system for both medical information and bioethical counseling. Models are already developing outside of mainstream pediatrics. Genetic screening is going direct to consumer quite rapidly. Acute care pediatrics and even uh, prenatal care and ultrasounds are available now at shopping malls. The care of children with special health care needs is more and more becoming the task of parental support groups who teach parents how to teach pediatricians to take care of their children with special health care needs. So we may need a new type of pediatrics and a new type of pediatric bioethics in which empowered and informed consumers look for pediatricians or teams of child health professionals to be their partners in figuring out what combination of prevention, screening, and intervention, both as therapy and as enhancement, will help them create and raise the children that the parents want to create and raise or to help them let those children die as the parents want them to die. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. If uh, John can uh, scoot down uh, toward the end, and I can invite our other uh, three panelists up. We have uh, about 15 minutes for um, some Q&A.
American team. Because I think a lot of the health problems that we're seeing in pediatrics are, in a sense, a very privileged, right? Mental health issues, because we really have treated many of these diseases that we can still children. So. No. Mm -hmm. As John said, the problem is this business model of medicine that we have in this country. Uh, there used to be an agency called the Office of Technology Assessment, and uh, Reagan abolished it, but one of its last reports, which I had the privilege of participating in, was a study of health supervision in pediatrics and concluded that it was either uh, proven to be useless, that is, there were studies that had no effects on health other than immunizations, for which you don't need a pediatrician, <coughs> or, or it was there were some parts of it that just weren't studied. I was practically convicted from the AAP for um, signing on to this report. But uh, the president of the AAP at the time sent a letter <coughs> uh, complaining about this and said, how are pediatricians going to make money if they don't do health supervision? It's about 40 or 50 percent of what they do. And the AAP has been systematically adding visits to the health supervision schedule uh, to help pediatricians keep up. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's as negative as that, um, just as the gastroenterologist need their gastroscopy, nephrology need their kidney biopsies, and so on. It's, it, it's, it's just as naked and more like that. And until we have a healthcare system which is not proper based, I don't see what's happening to me. One question, one, one comment from John, and then back to the audience. And I, I think parents need health supervision, it just doesn't work for them every two months for 15 minutes. They need it when they need it. And then they should be able to call someone and get it, even if it's 15 minutes. Right. But they also <clears throat> probably still want some wisdom and some advice and some Dr. Spock sort of, uh, um, you know, guidance, I think. Uh, yeah, Bob. There is some uh, role for that, but it's a limited role. And I do think that in an effort to accommodate people's different uh, views and approaches and wishes, I don't think we need to throw the scientific method out the window. And I think it's OK to say that uh, you know, if somebody wants to, to, uh, to do uh, um, something for a child that we can't imagine how to harm the child or help the child, that I don't have a problem with that. But for things that are actual interventions, I think we need to look for evidence. Of course, the problem is, as I try to say, that we have our standards of care, some of which are based on good science, and some of which are based on intermittent electronics, and some of which are based on uh, some of which are based on just the standard of care, because that's how we've always done it. So we can sometimes tend to be a little bit hypocritical by saying the folks who do a complementary or what's called complementary alternative medicine, you know, there's, there's no real scientific rationale for what you're doing, and we recognize that that's sometimes the case for what we do as well. No. I just want to say again, as I said in my earlier comments, just because something is complementary, alternative, or natural, doesn't mean it's safe. Oxygen was, it's ubiquitous. How could it possibly hurt anybody? Um, but for 80 years, we, we harmed a lot of people by giving them oxygen. But that's a good example of, of not alternative medicine. That's a good example of traditional standard of care that turned out to be a mistake because it was never properly studied. Right. I mean, well, it's interesting, if you look at who <coughs> really is going for the complementary and alternative medicine and pediatrics, this is the families of children with special health care needs. And part of the reason they're doing that is because, one, <coughs> the pediatricians aren't well suited for what they're looking for. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes what they're looking for is a cure, which nobody really has it, but it's also just they want much more of a partnership and a handful. And so I totally agree with you. Um, and in fact, the AAP statement when talking about complementary and alternative medicine it almost suggests that it's only in children with special health care needs, but there are plenty of parents who are using it now, for example, for enhancement. Yeah. Uh, the whole use of creatinine, creatinine for um, muscle strength. For muscle yeah. growth and things of that sort. So we are seeing some of that developing in the yeah. And the obligation to protect children from that toxicity, that sort of independent obligation to children that pediatricians have uh, separate from. Parental discretion is always one of the real interesting areas in pediatric ethics. Question here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Don. We have a protest. I don't have an answer, only to say uh, I, I don't see even the beginning of uh, children's hospital or pediatric residency programs even asking the question. So, so if, if anything, the trend seems to be going the other way. Sort of in the direction that uh, 
guys were all on the left. Yeah. And figure into more genetic screening. Yada, yada, yada. That if the uh, behavioral problems and all the problems that are now the most common causes of death, both in pediatrics and as a result of childhood behaviors and activities uh, in, in adulthood, or as we heard uh, yesterday from Jim Heckman, in uh, you know, early child development and uh, physical interventions like uh, having a home visitor go to his houses once a week for six months of life are likely to have a much bigger impact on overall population health than uh, anything that would influence health. But uh, don't hear it from the American Academy of Pediatrics, don't hear it from uh, Congress and health reform, and don't hear it much from Biden. And we remain with the 15 minute visit, and if these are all going to be behavioral issues um, from the outbreak. But I have to at least push back on my back because it does raise the question, is that where we want pediatrics to go? And if we do, we really have to change our structure of our education. So there is the book site of independent viewing there as being several different tracks in pediatrics. You might want to have your acute care type doctor of one type, and you might want to have an Indian college so you have to have that. The third group is um, a much more behavioral oriented pediatrics. And uh, that's really in a sense what we're going to have to do moving. And then, of course, the melting feeling of the children with special health studies, which is the largest growing population of pediatric needs. We're going to have a very brief comment by Mark. Last, last one by Mark. The last comment? Second to last, because oh, okay, good. I don't we, we need to respect comment. our elders. No, I, I would suggest, and I think this is what Lanny, I would take Lanny's argument one step further and say that I don't think it's necessarily part of this one that's pediatrician to the answer. That, that maybe pediatricians are the ones that do treat kids when they get sick. And maybe the people who deal with issues uh, such as uh, childhood obesity, et cetera, things that require a very different approach, maybe not going to be pediatricians. I've seen a huge problem for kids is the fact for so many kids, my wife is a teacher, is that a huge number of kids can't read and write well. I would suggest to you that that's not a problem for pediatricians to fix. There are others who are better suited to fix that. And I will not they can, I can't say that. I would say these, some of these huge problems that we identify as pediatric problems, maybe they're not going to best be fixed by pediatricians. Maybe that's not going to be our role. Uh, I'm, I'm going to close with an optimistic comment. So we will leave John for the most cynical and best <laughs> person in the room. Uh, the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health changed its name five years ago. And it wasn't just a name change. I spent the last two days with a whole bunch of colleagues um, with the, the whole first year class on uh, uh, essentially what's become a public health curriculum. And the, the, the case that we discussed the last two days was uh, a bad baby. And, and how did this baby turn out so bad? And what were the causes of it? And it was exhilarating. I mean, these students spent two days, and they went to the legislature to talk to public health people, and epidemiologists that looked at our drunk driving laws, and a hundred different things. And really were a buzz with all different ways of trying to produce better babies. Apart from the medical, you know, apart from trying to treat him or her after the career or just doing abortions or things like that. So, and there are other schools that are starting to do things like that. So I think there is starting to be a shift in looking for social, political, public health um, solutions to these problems instead of the, the tired old doctor patient doing tests and treatments. I would like to thank our spectacular panelists. Uh, we're going to have a very brief uh, break now. I'd like uh, people to gather back at uh, 9.50 for the next session. Thank you.